Only one of y'all can win. Only one. And it's good to have nine allies when you're up in that office because their expertise may become a problem for you and now you got a friend that you can call on and get some help versus somebody that's waiting for something to go wrong so they can say, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Because everybody here has one thing in common. They love Flint, Michigan. With that being said, that keep everything the way it is. Uh, like I said, I really appreciate this. I uh, appreciate all media that is here. I'm kind of upset. Especially Flint B. Yes. <laughs> Mainly Flint B. Mainly Flint B. Yes. Thank you. I have a problem. Why? is the only, the first article about this event. This event has been scheduled ever since the Friday that they had to drop out of the race. So why did they wait to, was it, was it yesterday, to put out a report talking about three of the candidates? In that report, was it anything about this forum here today? None. I got a problem with that. And <laughs> I like that ringtone. <laughs> and also, this election is just as important to me as any election, whether it's a primary election or a general election. I'm tired of people downplaying this election. And elections like this, all elections are important. All elections need to have a high voter turnout. Yeah. I agree with that. And that is my goal starting from this day forth. I have plans put in set to where we're going to have three tables. One table, if you are registered or not registered, you will go to that table and get you an absentee ballot application. Then you will take that absentee ballot application to another table and get you a vote by mail I call it vote by mail, vote from your couch. I don't call it absentee ballot anymore. Then it will be another table that you go and you put your gold envelope in, sealed. And then that one will be turned into the elected official office. I think if we can have four or five of those in Flint during the election, our voter turnout will get higher. Do anybody agree with me? Everything, yeah, everything will be co everything will be coordinated with the elected official office. Okay. Well, it just started a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, this, 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 this election only, only been scheduled. It ain't even been two months. Okay. And so, and I, and what I did, I gave myself a date to where I would have enough time to have everything as good as possible. If I would have contacted all these candidates and then ran something. Two weeks later, we probably would have had two or three candidates up here right now. Do 
it again Monday. Do it again Monday. Yeah, do it again Monday. Yeah. Y'all want to do it again Monday? Yeah. Well, they had a, they, they more people to meet, do it again Monday. To not here, but in some place in the first ward, we got to pray. Do it again Monday. I want them to meet first ward. Do it again Monday. I know that they want to be seen, don't they? Do it in the first ward. Okay, board. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. We can get started. Do it in the first ward Monday again. All right. I would like to welcome everyone to this 31st District State Representative Forum. Will all city officials please stand up? Welcome, and we honor you, and thanks for your service. Will all pastors and community activists please stand up? That's all of us. That's what I want. Give yourselves a hand. Yes, sir. How you doing, Miss Brenda Clack? I'm good. I'm real good. County Commissioner. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Okay. Pastor Avery Aldridge is supposed to be here and lead us in prayer. He's not here. So I'm going to take this opportunity to ask Ms. Clack to do the prayer for us. Don't have to come up there. No, you do not. Everyone, would you stand and hold hands, please? Thank you. You're not going to get to And I saw my husband point. <laughs> which I, you would bow your heads as you are standing. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank thee personally for allowing us to be a part of this gathering. We thank you, O oh Lord, for letting us be a part of this gathering. We hope that this night will be the beginning of a new thrust, a thrust to make government strong, to make government complete, and to cover all of the individuals in our community that need to be covered. We, the candidates all have different backgrounds, they have different education, they have different thoughts, but I know they all have one main thought, and that is to make Flint great. So dear Lord, Guide us as we leave this place, when we leave this place. Guide us until Tuesday to make the right decisions. And guide us after that, even if whomever doesn't make it, to keep working for this city of Flint. Thank you for allowing Richard Jones to lead this group. And we thank all of you who are here tonight. I ask these prayers in my son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I would like to introduce the uh, candidates. We're starting at that end with Mr. Sherwood P. You can also give a little brief bio of yourself. Thank you. My name is Sherwood P. Jr. I'm a lifelong Flint resident of the United States Marine Veteran, and I uh, love the city of Flint. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Flack. Michael Christopher Floyd Flack. Um, I'm a product of Flint, product of the Flint Community School, attended North State University, I'm a teacher at Genesee Flint Academy. I teach middle and high school studies, uh, I'm sorry, middle and high school social studies and political science, and I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to fight for the people for Flint. Me on Tuesday. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Candace Machat. Um, like everyone up here, I'm a lifelong Flint resident and a product of Flint Community Schools as well. I am actually the only candidate who has worked uh, for the State House of Representatives. I was a legislative aide uh, to then Representative Neely. Within the past year, I recently worked for Dr. Weaver. I was the public information officer 
for the city of Flint. And I currently work at WFLT. I am CC Sherrill on uh, 1420 AM as well as freelance writing. Oh, that thing. Hi, I'm Santino Guerra. I'm a Flint City Councilman representing the third board. Uh, I'm the Legislative Government Operations and Grants Committee for the City of Flint. I'm a student at the University of Michigan Flint, double majoring in criminal justice and sociology. I have attended Harvard Business School summer venture management program out in Boston, Massachusetts, and just recently completed my certificate in economics for management. Um, I have also previously served in the United States Senate as a Senate page out in Washington, D.C., and as Michigan Dega's Vice President of Chapter Development back in 2016. Hi, I'm Claudia Perkins, a community activist, lifelong resident. I was the first African-American female to be the highest position in the bargaining unit. I co-managed the uh, Delphi plants on the union side. I was the highest position in bargaining. So I'm a community activist with several organizations under my belt in leading uh, in so many capacities, but I'm just a lifelong resident and glad to be here. Hello, my name is Monica Galloway. I am currently the president of the Flint City Council. I've served with the Flint City Council for the last six years. I am the only candidate that has consistent experience in legislation that is currently on the ticket. Um, but more than that, I have served this community during the water crisis. Um, and the water crisis is not over, and I am hoping for the opportunity to go and hopefully seek some vindication and justice on behalf of this community during this partial term election. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Sean Crowdy. I'm currently the, the Director of Community Recreation for the City of Flint. I was also, I was at under Bear Weaver's administration. I'm currently in that same position under the new administration. I'm a golf a lifelong resident of Flint. I graduated from Southwestern Academy in 1990. I earned my, my bachelor's degree from, in social work from Ferris State University in 94, and my master's from uh, Eastern Michigan in 2003. I am not a uh, politician, I'm a public servant. I've been working with youth and families for 20 plus years. Of course, you'll hear more about me later on this evening. Thank you, Rich, for this event. Can you all hear me? Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sharif Lee. I'm an attorney. I work at Michigan State College of Law as an assistant director there. I also teach foundations of law there. I am active in the community. I am a literacy tutor. Um, I attend Bethlehem Temple Church, and I'm part of the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan. I also am a chief negotiator. I was a chief negotiator for Lockheed Martin, which is a Fortune 50 company in Atlanta, Georgia. I returned back to Flint to work at MSU, and I also am active in working with many community foundations as the board of directors. Thank you. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Thank you. Each candidate will be asked eight questions. They will have four questions that they can answer in a minute. They will have four questions that they can answer in two minutes. With that being said, I would like to thank my timekeeper, Mr. Mark Baldwin, please stand up. And once again, because of the lack of attention this race has had, I would love to thank everybody that got their form of recording right now. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of the media that's here. Thank you very, very much. Now, I have some questions set for Dr. Laura Sullivan to ask. She's not here, so I'm gonna ask them. And then also, once again, Pastor Avery Audrey has an emergency this morning. He called me and we were talking on the phone and so I went down. So he's not going to be in attendance. So Sister Clack led us in prayer and I will ask his questions. So the first question and when we ask these questions, I 
I'm going to do from all my time sitting up in the city councils for hour after hour after hour. I learned. So we're going to start the first question and let Ms. Sharif be the first one to lead off. The second question, we're going to, Mr. Crowdy will lead. Third question, Monica Galloway, fourth question. And good thing we got eight people because we got eight questions. <laughs> so everybody will get a chance to be the first one to answer a question. And everybody will be a chance to be the last one to speak on a question. Fair as I can do it. Okay. During the years of 2014 through 2017, the height of the Flint water crisis, what was your emotions and how were you affected? This is a one minute question. You got the timer ready? All right, let me hand it and let me put the mic down over here and we can get started. Not better yet. Bro, yeah, go. My camera. During the years of 2014 and 2017, I was attending Thurgood Marshall School of Law in Houston, Texas, attending law school where I graduated with honors. I frequently came back to Michigan, to Flint, where my mom stayed, where I was staying, um, during my breaks, and I did everything that I could to help out, whether it was water drives or just participating in anything that was getting out the word about the water crisis. Um, my emotions are just upset, you know, that these, the, the reason why we were going through the water crisis was because of policy decisions, especially when you're in law school and you're learning how to write policy and you're learning about how you, you know, effectuate people's lives with law. So to see something like this happening in our city was just discouraging and I wanted to do something about it. Thank you. Sean? So at that time, I was working in the Flint Community Schools. I was a school social worker, also ended up being a behavior specialist before I joined Mayor Weaver's administration. I was, of course, upset. The water crisis uh, deeply affected the young people I work with and their families because some of them were not available to have resources that were needed. Also, it messed them up, messed our young people up cognitively. I saw students who were at high grade levels, and once the lead and stuff affected their bodies, everything changed. You saw seeing behavior problems that we haven't seen before, but really it was discouraging. Working with our youth, and it felt like there was no hope at the time, but still you have to keep working with people. You keep doing things day, one day at a time. That's all we have is one day at a time to make a change. And also for myself, you know, you had to do different things, brush your teeth with bottled water. You didn't know how long it was going to last. But it's just a change of lifestyle. I'm constantly, constantly defending my city from friends that were calling from out of town, like, is it safe to come visit you? <laughs> so you had to constantly just stay prayed up and be good about Flint still. Time. Ms. Monica Galloway. Thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me we're good. Yeah. All right, let's go. So um, I found myself on the Flint City Council under emergency manager rule. Um, my first response was um, disappointing because at the time I, I did seek out Darnell Early, Jerry Ambrose, um, Senator Stabenow, and Congressman Kildee all um, in personal um, conversations about the water. Um, but as one that is a believer, I can remember the very first time of really hearing about it. This is the honest to God truth. The first thing that popped in my head is, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. Because I didn't, you don't know what to do. Um, with that, um, I did actually um, seek out a meeting uh, with our governor, but I worked with the Michigan Black Caucus, the local elected officials, and we got bottled bottle water um, brought in, so we delivered. I have five minutes. That's what right. five no, means. No. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Five seconds. I mean five seconds. Yes. Yeah. So you Rich, come on out. And so I, I distributed water, Rich, during that time as well. Thank you. We can give her. You want ten nope. minutes a second? Set. Okay. I'm thank set. you. I'm I so sorry. That I was following the directions. So I, I, I do, do this one five seconds. And don't get mad at me when we ask the next question. <laughs> 
All right, Miss Claudia Perkins. Okay, the first thing was anger because I had the nephew who had the highest leg count in Genesee County, and the little boy that was on the cover of Time Magazine was my cousin. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of dogs in this fight. I had uh, contracted E. coli in my body and broke out like crazy. I am with the Democracy Defense League, so we're boots on the ground. We took many, many buses of people, residents from the city of Flint to Lansing, on the regular, protesting the EPA and the DEQ. We also flew to Washington, D.C. and talked with the highest people in the land in the D, uh, DEQ and EPA. And uh, when we left there, that was when the first $170 million was cut loose because of the water. So we uh, are still boots on the ground, working and fighting with the water issues right now, currently. Santino Guerrero. Yeah, back in 2014, I was still in high school, and my first emotion was disbelief, to tell you the truth. I couldn't believe as, as a teenager that the city and the state could poison an entire city and deny them a basic human right. And, and, and it took a long time, year, almost probably a couple years to really truly stop drinking the water because we didn't fully believe it. And my, my sister herself, I mean, we were moms that don't drink the water, but you know, of course, as kids, we'd still run inside and you know, get a glass and still sip on it. And it wasn't until we started seeing months and months after the fact, the side effects, the time, Time magazines, the, all of the things that were going on and impacting us. So uh, my emotion, my first emotion was disbelief, and uh, it's still hard to believe as a Flint resident that this could happen to an entire city. It really is. Is Candace. Hold on. Everybody give me a round of applause <laughs> for getting her name right. Candace Bouchette. I got her wrong. Take the class back. <laughs> it's Mushette, but that's okay. Candace Mush. In 2014, in 2014, um, I was actually still volunteering in my community working for a local council person who then became state rep. So in 2015, uh, when the water crisis really hit and it was out there, I think one of the biggest things was just personally, I was having some neurological issues, going to a neurologist, couldn't figure out what was wrong or why it was happening. Um, but in pressing through that, once we found out that there was lead in our water, my first uh, reaction was to spring to action. Working at the State House of Representatives as a legislative aide, I actually facilitated um, water hearings in front of um, legislators across the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and two, of the, two of the things that we covered was one, water affordability, because before Flint had a water crisis as far as whether we could drink it or not, we had an affordability issue. And then the second was actually dealing with the fact that there was lead in the water. As a result of those hearings that I facilitated, our office was the only office to get a bill through um, uh, regarding the water crisis and bill packaging. And uh, aside from that, I also went to DC and talked to Congress and helped lobby to get that money down here as well. Michael Clack, hold on for a minute, Mike. Okay, we're ready to go. You ready? Let's get it. In 2014, I was working actually in the Flint Community School at Holmes Middle School. Actually, I was working with Mr. Crowley here with your coworkers. I was a behavioral specialist at the time. Um, when the water crisis first hit, to me, my first emotion was pain, was anguish. I was upset because we trust the people. We look to them for leadership. We look to them for guidance. We look to them to lead us. So if the people who we trusted to lead us can allow something this of this magnitude to happen to us, their constituents, I felt betrayed, I felt hurt. So in 2015, uh, I worked, I started to volunteer at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church with their water distribution and their water uh, delivery program. I went door to door, uh, taking water out of a U-Haul truck with a dolly, me personally walking up and down the street delivering water to people that were unable to go and get water themselves. In 2016, I worked for Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I worked for. Oh, it took one minute. <laughs> uh, you 
ready? Mr. Ball, ready? ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Mr. Sherwood P. Yes, my, my uh, first impression was disbelief because I was wondering if the water in Flint was so good, why hadn't it happened to the Flint River 30 years ago? We drink that, you know, we, the water's been through here ever since I've been born. And uh, if 30 years ago it wasn't any good, what made them think that it would be good to use today? So that was one of the, uh, the emotions I had, disbelief, and uh, how I was affected. Uh, I had to worry about my family, my neighbors, uh, how we were going to be able to sustain ourselves with water that you couldn't drink. And till today, we still don't drink the water. We use bottled water. OK, thank you. Candidates, I have a question to ask you all. Can we have all one-minute answers instead of two-minute answers because Mr. Sherwood has became a part of our debate. Okay. That's good with y'all. Yeah. I know that's good with you. It's good with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Ms. Laura Sullivan, will you please stand up? Everybody give her a round of applause. <laughs> this is another question. Doctor. Dr. Laura Sullivan. That's my motivator right there. In 2014, I met her, and the conversation and the, inf and the information that she gave me fired me up. I thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And you're supposed to ask that question and this one that I'm going to ask. All right, the next question. I told y'all me I'm like, man. What did this water crisis inspire you to do? One minute answers, please, and we're going to start with Sean Crowder. It inspired me to step up my game. I was already working with young people and uh, families trying to get them resources. So when the water crisis hit, I had to make sure I went to different organizations to continue what I was doing, of course, to make things right with, the, with my uh, population. Um, I've been working with young people forever, and I have a passion that, of course, they are our future. So I want to make sure they have the best of the best. So I made sure I did right by them when the crisis hit. Um, are you ready? Sorry, Mark. No, hold on. It's, no problem. You, you didn't take half this time? <laughs> I could have probably took only the other half. Yes, I will. What did your experience from this water crisis inspire you to do? Sir, um, it inspired me to pay closer attention to what the residents were saying because when it originally came out, there was um, things from decision makers as if what was being said couldn't possibly be true. So it caused me to um, be more attentive. Um, it caused me to have the courage to challenge our emergency manager. If you look at the um, article that was written around General Motors coming off of the water line, I was the one that said that we were clearly being used as um, rats. Um, and challenged the emergency manager who declared that because it would take $12 million to switch over, he wasn't gonna do it. And we actually took a vote and that vote yielded a seven to one vote, which me would, including saying we wanted to go back. So that was one of the inspirations from this water crisis. Ms. Claudia Perkins. Okay, I have worked with the, uh, the Democratic Party, the National Wildlife sent me to Washington, D.C. The UAW sent me to Washington, D.C. We went on the hill and fought like wild tigers about the water issue. I talked to Dr. Peter Gravettis, who was over all the fresh water in the United States. And we talked to the highest EPA in the land. What I realized was that they hadn't got the real story. So I went on MSNBC and I told the real story. And also I was on um, HBO, a couple of months ago, and PBS Frontline News, and I told the real story to the whole world. And also, 
I've been fighting in the democracy defensively. And I say we're the boots on the ground. We're the ones taking all the buses out of here to Lansing to protest with the DEQ and the EPA. And those are the things that I've been doing to help fight this travesty and also try to get some type of impact to uh, get rid of the emergency manager law. Yes. Just obliterate it. Mr. Santino Guerrero. Yeah, it inspired me to fight for change. It's exactly what it did. In 2014, I was 16 years old. Uh, two years later, I decided to run for city council at 19 years old, uh, getting elected in the third ward, being the youngest in history. While on the council, we were able to fight to get pipes in place throughout the city, uh, still fighting for restoration, uh, still fighting. Uh, we, we were able to get a water source, a clean water source, away from the Point River, officially, back on city council. So, and it continued, this, this uh, has continued to inspire me to continue fighting for the front residents, not only here at the local level, but at the state level. Miss Candice, you said, did I get it right? Mushat, and what hold it on, did was inspire me. I only have a minute. It inspired me. Hold on, hold on, stop, stop. Start the clock again. For Candice, for Candice, for Candice, Rich. You ready, Mr. Baldwin? I'm ready. Okay, the lady that just told me to forget it. Let's go. Candace, you said. It inspired me to do what I had already been doing, and that is continue to work even harder in my community to make sure that my community um, is educated on what certain things mean. The fact that uh, I, I think a lot of this happened because they thought that they could get away with it because they didn't think that we would be smart enough to pay attention, that we weren't worth $100 a day. Um, like I said, I was a uh, part of the only office to get a law passed of the fact that they had to um, give us a, more, a quicker time and warning us when there were contaminants in our water. So I helped fight for that to make sure that we are warned when they do contaminate our water. As well as I went to DC, talked to Congress. I've been in several meetings with the EPA. Uh, and just m more importantly, um, standing on that front line and continuing to fight, like Ms. Claudia said, uh, to get rid of that emergency manager law. It has to go because they can just come in and then they're not even held to a revenue building standard. They can just sell off things in your city and that's not right. And Flint is a good example of what happens when someone is not held to a revenue building standard and comes in your city and makes choices. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Michael, you ready? Ready. Clack. Well, what inspired me to do was go out and help people. My thing, my first thing was after after I started working with the water delivery, the water deployment, I started looking around for who might be hiring to educate people about what was going on. So I ended up taking a job at Hamilton Community Health Network as a community health worker. And my job was to go door to door to inf inform everyone about what was going on with the water situation. My job was to inform seniors about what was going on, how they would be affected. It was, it was, it was to inform parents on how their child, children would be affected. And as a teacher, I see it every single day. I see how this lead is affecting their temperament, how it's affecting their behavior. I see how it affects their, their rashes on their bodies and their hair loss. And I see how the girls have to go to the bathroom two or three, two or three times a day and fix their hair, beat their edges, because the edges, you know, the hair is falling out on the edges. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not being funny, but it's the truth. But it's the truth of the matter is, mm -hmm. you know, we have a serious problem here. And we need to let, we, we can't let it stop now. We have to turn our voices up and let everybody know because the world thinks that it's over. Okay. And it is not over. Mr. Sherwood P. Jr. Hold on for a second. Are ready? Let's go. Let's go. It inspired me to start paying more attention, uh, learning about uh, the, the lead poisoning, the pipes. Also, it drove me to contact the Rachel Reform Boards, which I am a member of, to get water sent in. I also got with my uh, UAW local 659 to have water brought in so that it could be disseminated throughout the, the community. Thank you. 
I would like to introduce Renetta Richards. She will bring y'all the next two questions. I still have to go. Oh, no, no, no. I forgot about Man, I'm going to get jumped by nine people when it's over with. Miss Sharice Lee, are you ready for Miss Lee? I'll ask a question. Ready? water crisis, what happened, it inspired me to do my best at the time when it happened. Like I said before, I was in law school and I wanted to, you know, run and protest and do all these things, but you have to stay focused and you have to make sure that you get trained and you get experience and you understand what's going on so we don't let failed policy happen again. So for me, it was making sure, you know, my time in the military was trained to leave no man behind. So we had plummeting literacy rates because of this, so I decided to become a literacy tutor, right? I decided to take children under my wing and my Girl Scouts troop and continue to help the community recover. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Ms. Renetta Richards. She's a former teacher at Flint Southwestern and she's currently teaching in Detroit. question. Currently, the Flint Community School District has an expected $5.7 million operation deficit, a legacy debt of $18.4 million that began with the water crisis in 2014, a heightened financial need to assist special needs students affected by lead poisoning. All of this is compiled with a drop in enrollment, a drop in local funding for property taxes, and suburban or charter school competition. As the 34th District State House Representative, how do you plan to assist Flint Community Schools District tackle the staggering ongoing financial burden? So, um, one of the things that um, you may not know is the school district was facing a deficit in 15 when they closed down three of our elementaries. Um, I have been in constant conversation with um, the school board but I also went through all of the state agencies that were over the school aid and funding. And they made it clear that your board members on the local level are responsible for those decisions. And so the only thing that I would be able to do is one, fight to see if we can get those budget cuts, the 60 million that, that was cut from um, Governor Whitmer's special education funds. Hope that you can negotiate with your colleagues to see the need for the residents and the children in Flint based on what has happened that will lead to recovery from the Flint water crisis. Okay, um, the Democracy Defense League, we have gone to the board, I don't know how many times, we actually challenged them on so many issues concerning the children in this city. One of my main, main problems was that they were taking all the schools out of our neighborhood. That meant the children were going out, so the money was going out. And I have a heartburn with that. What we need to do is try and get some legislation put together that will bring some school, public school back, especially on the north end of Flint, and put some legislation in place that's going to cause them to put back into our community like they took out like they tear down, they need to build up. And we challenge them constantly on those types of things. I don't like the way they run the, count, the uh, school board, but, you know, I'm just one person. But I'm a fighting person, so I'm telling you, I'm, I'm here to do whatever I can to help restore the north end of Flint especially and bring our schools back. Mr. Sarah Guerrero. Uh, absolutely, yeah. The thing we can do if like in the state house would be fighting for more funding for these schools. Because you know, just thinking about the simple fact that I'm, I'm only 21 now and all the schools that I went to not too long ago are boarded up. Uh, they're abandoned. Uh, they're eyesores out of the community that they used to want to provide a quality education for their students. And unfortunately today it's not like that. Um, I'm also a local substitute teacher and having taught in a classroom 
when you have 37, 40 kids roughly staring at you and you're, you're, one, you're one educator trying to attend to their needs. And after the Flint water crisis, it has impacted our youth in a different way. So sometimes these students have different needs. So also getting education for the special um, education classes and uh, other needs like that. So really fighting for education, not only for just a certain grade level or a specific, a specific type of student, but for all students in the city of Flint. All right, um, so there's a couple of things that you have to look at, especially when it relates to education and then Flint schools separately. One of the things that we realize in the state of Michigan is that they're constantly making cuts here and there to education and saying they found money um, for that education. So one of the things you have to fight for is the fact that there are no more cuts to education. And Flint, like you said, because we have the water crisis, we have a higher need, um, higher special needs rate. So there needs to be some special funding set aside for uh, Flint residents to be able to help those children with special needs. We also have to look at the fact that you have a lot of students that go to charter schools and during the count days when the money is given, those charter schools take those money and then they expel those kids and those kids have to go back to Flint schools and the money does not go with them. Yeah. That needs to stop. The money that those charter schools get, once that student is gone, that money needs to go with that student back to that Flint school. Um, and then we also need to look at just being a stronger support system. Unfortunately, we have a lot of parents who are not able to be home because they have multiple jobs. So we have to look at more wraparound services. We have to look at having um, more mental health care, dental, visual, all those different things in the schools. Okay, this question is a little bit different for me because I'm an employee of a charter school but I'm an advocate for public schools. I'm a product of the Flint schools. The reason why I'm at a charter school now is because when the school, when Flint schools closed, the school that I was working at, I still wanted to be effective in, kid, in, in children's lives, and I wanted to be working with students. So I looked around for schools that I could work at, and I was blessed to find where I landed. I landed at Genesee STEM Academy. Now, <coughs> with that being said, we do need to work on both, if elected, I will work on both sides of the aisle with partnerships so we can, get the money, get funding back to Flint schools. Because last I checked, the special education rate had risen up to 43%, in the Flint, and that's just in the Flint community schools. And like we were just saying, charter schools in the county schools also, not just charter schools, but county schools are taking the Flint students. You know, it's not just the charter schools. So that money should come back, because if a student goes to Grand Lake High School and they get suspended, that money stays in Grand Lake. It does not come back to Flint with that student. So it's not just charter schools, it's, it's the entire all the way around. Okay. Mr. Sir, one thing. As funding for schools, I would definitely look into how we could redistribute the school fund. Uh, I, I think that should be uh, where the money, the lottery is supposed to pay for the school. So where the lottery money is most used, that area should be the most recipient of those funds. So we will definitely try to figure out some way to uh, redistribute those funds and uh, get with the principal, uh, school board president, and see what it is he needs, what he likes to do, how we can go about it. Working as a team, he can work from one direction. I, the state representative, can work from another direction. And together, we should be able to come up with something that would be very constructive for uh, the city of Flint. So the question was about the deficit in funding. So the deficit comes from our lack of population for having a tax base. We have half the population that we used to have, so how are we going to have the same amount of schools? We can't do that. But what we need to do is focus on building our tax base, and that's by bringing people here. Over the last couple of years, we had a lot of people leave because of the water crisis, and we all know that. We have family that, are, that is gone. But what we need to do is look at incentivizing living in Flint. How do we do that? Get state pulled monies to incentivize people to start businesses here. There you have jobs, then you have people that come back, you have children who go to schools, which increases funding. Mr. Sean Crowder. Okay, first I agree with a couple of my fellow candidates about when our students from Flint Green schools get suspended or when they transfer, when they go back to the Flint schools, the money does not come back. That will help stabilize the district. Also, an increase of the uh, pupil, the money for each student. 
for our district. The urban districts always get the short end of the stick. Also, currently, I'm doing things to help out the school district. I'm uh, on the classroom support fund. In 2019, we raised over, raised over 16000 to help out those teachers to teach our young people, because that's another issue. Our teachers do not have the proper materials and whatnot, so our the classroom support fund has been around for 36 years, and our job is to make sure that we raise money for our teachers to have what they need to teach our young people. And also, I'm involved in a, a group, a community group called Involved Dad on Monday mornings. It's early Monday mornings, we go to different schools to just greet our students. The kids need to see the community being involved in their education. So it's just a lot of smiling faces when we do that. Parents are extremely happy. It's an awesome, uh, awesome event to just do every Monday at different schools, charter and public. On you. Next question. Thank you. The city of Flint's constituents have suffered drastically behind state officials' decisions surrounding the water crisis. You will ultimately hold the voice for Flint in Lansing, Michigan. After being lead poisoned as babies, small children, adolescents, and adults, the student population will age out of general education and become adults with their developmental disabilities. They will have a continuous need for financial, educational, social, and mental assistance. How do you plan to implement a program designed to address the effects of lead on the human body, educational development, and higher level achievement for these students and the Flint community as a whole? Mr. First of all, I uh, would put legislation in place. I mean, I would go to the right people that I could pull legislation together with to address the, the, the water crisis, for one thing. I mean, the water crisis has hurt us in so many ways, it's unreal. So I pull legislation together to help fix some things. Number one, put the criminals where they need to go. Yep. Number two, I would um, put something in place that would uh, help the children because as they get older, I don't want it to be a pipeline to prison. Right. And that's what I really see happening because of this water crisis. The kids are acting out. There was one uh, young lady, her son was kicked out of school 50 times when he was in the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Do you think there could be a problem? Yes, I do. So I don't want them to grow up and that be a pipeline to prison when they really seriously need some help. So we need to put legislation together for that particular issue. We need to put legislation together and we need to hold criminals accountable. I just really believe yes, that. And you. nobody has been uh, served in that capacity. Thank you. Ms. Santino Guerrero. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. It, it'd be creating grant, maybe grant funding for special programs that would be ran really in-house by people who are from the city of Flint. Say the truth because the, the honest truth is people who are growing up and have these disabilities may need extra job training and help find jobs that can they can actually get because the problem is that that's going to affect their it may be the mental it may be a physical ability they're going to be have to have programs that are going to train them for jobs where they'll be able to sustain a life and a minimum wage that's affordable for these residents and all touching on the criminal justice system that, that's, that's a great thing to touch on because the fact is people with disabilities or with mental illnesses are being put behind bars and it's just making their mental illness worse. It, and that should not be, that should not be happening. What they need to do is make sure they can go back to the mental institu institutions where they can maybe be rehabilitated or help with the proper medication. So it's a, it's those two things can be jobs and making sure the criminal justice system is fixed. Ms. Candace. So one of the things that we were looking at um, when I worked at the city of Flint under Dr. Weaver, that's actually one of the things that we were looking at was the fact that these children that have these special needs as a result of being born lead poison were eventually going to grow up and need to be able to uh, give, be given the proper tools to compete in this world um, on the job market and the global market. So one of the things that we were looking at doing was one, getting more services for the special needs children uh, while they were uh, while they're still in school, looking at getting them 
uh, the anger management classes and the different things that they are going to need as a result of being lead poisoned. And then at the same time, working to bring more people in to help develop the talent for the jobs and the, the multiple job industries that um, will come to Flint as a result of us being better from the lead crisis. So uh, the two things that were that I am going to fight for once I get to Lansing is to make sure that those special services still come to Flint and that too, that the uh, talent investment that we were promised that they would bring to Flint will still come to Flint uh, to help train those as they age out of school. Thank you. Ready? Mr. Michael Clack. Yeah. I believe that education is key. And I'm just going to say that and leave that there. But along with that, I believe that we need to bring back vocational training. And I said that to a lot of people. I said that because there's no shortage of people with master's degrees and master's degrees. But there's a shortage of people. There's a shortage of plumbers and electricians. There's a shortage of, there's a, I'm sorry, there's a shortage of bricklayers. There's a shortage of people that come out of school have with a cosmetology degree. When I was in school, we had each high school, uh, there were four high schools in Flint, and each high school had a specialty. My high school, Southwestern, was nursing. Northern had mechanics. Uh, Central had model UN. Northwestern had nursing. There were different programs that we could go to the school by our regular school. You know, we had skill center. They had vocational training. We had home ec in school. You know, these are things that, oh, now that's just called life training. We had these things that was instilled in us, and that we had to take these classes. With these kids nowadays, that are that are are suffering from these lead from from these from not even just the lead lead legionnaires whatever the water illnesses that they suffer from they need alternative ways alternative reasons and, and means to get their education they're going to grow up one day college is not necessarily for everyone but they still need to be able to maintain a positive lifestyle and be members of society successful members of society. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood P. That is a good question, and I am not really sure how to handle that. It would be definitely something that I would look into. I would have to surround myself with uh, very knowledgeable people to be able to give input from those that uh, are experts in the field. And we would definitely uh, uh, look forward to working in, in that arena. Ms. Cherise Lee, hold on. We're ready? Okay. So, creating a program for students we don't really know the full effects of what lead has done to children. We can, we know it's the mental disabilities. We know for sure that literacy is one of those things. Literacy rates from 2014 to 2017 in the city of Flint plummeted. So that's why I choose to spend my time as a literacy tutor at the Kofi Center because I know that children do not have a chance if they cannot read and write. How are you going to have an upward trajectory if you can't read and write? Even if you're trying to go to a vocational school, even if you're trying to further your education. So literacy is something that we have to pay attention to and we have to make sure that when we get those intangibles in a settlement from the state, that we make sure that if we're going to have a program, literacy definitely is one of the things that should be top on our list because children need to know how to read and write and they also, it, it will make sure that our community is going to be best as it can because if, if they don't know how to read and write, it's going to be difficult for them to move forward. Thank you. You ready? Repeat the question for me, please. Oh, well, it's quite a bit. <laughs> Hello. The city of Flint's constituents have suffered drastically behind state officials' decisions surrounding the water crisis. You will ultimately hold the voice for Flint and Lansing, Michigan. After being lead poisoned as babies, small children, adolescents, and adults, the student population will age out of general education and become adults with de developmental disabilities. They will have a continuous need for financial, educational, social, and mental assistance. How do you plan to implement a program designed to address the effects of lead on the human body educational development, and higher level achievement for these students and the Flint community as a whole. Uh, vocational training is key. Um, I agree with uh, one of my candidates was talking about vocational training because everybody cannot, everybody's not gonna go to college. Also tap into what's already in the community. You have different places where different jobs, like uh, Goodwill hires young people who don't have uh, we have special needs, so tap into what's already in our community and try to get funding and resources to what's here right now. Mr. 
Ready, Mark? So, that is um, the responsibility of a civil lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. But this is the reason why the lawsuits that this community has filed need to be responded to. Civil lawsuits, I'm not a lawyer, but I love law, are designed to see what the impact of what has been done to their children and what it will cost to make them whole. And it's designed to look in the future. What are they gonna need? Um, in my opinion, that is the number one thing. The state is liable. And the first thing that whoever gets in the seat should be trying to do is extend the legislation that is about to close that will allow those that have poisoned this community to go free because the statute of limitation is arising. And so settle those lawsuits, let parents decide what the next steps for their children are. We can't wait 18 years for legislators, which none of us will be there then, are responsible for doing what only doctors and other neurologists and things should be deciding. So to me, they should settle those lawsuits and fairly compensate residents and their children and let them decide what the path is for their children. Thank you, um, Ms. Renetta. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Oh, excuse me. Just ignore him. Just okay. ignore him. All right. Dismiss him. Okay. Once again, Reverend Aldridge is not here, so I'm going to ask his questions. Um, after I ask his questions, we're going to take a five minute uh, intermission. And during that five minute mission, we can get with me, we can sell raffle tickets or whatever. Like I said, once again, it's gonna be a 50-50 drawing. The winner gets 50%, the church gets 25%, and Million Man Incorporated get 25%. Okay, so this question is, it is clear as day that the water crisis has had a very negative effect on the city of Flint. What is your view on how this water crisis have affected public housing and your view on land bank? Up our stuff. Yep. Well, um, I sit on the board of directors for the land bank. Uh, so to, to touch on that as well, I think it has impacted us because on the, on the board of directors, we are receiving homes, uh, more homes than we were able to receive funding uh, each cycle to get demos. Uh, which is a crazy amount of homes because people are losing their houses because they can't afford them. They're they're getting liens. They're getting their people are aging out. People are passing away, and family members aren't coming back to their homes. And it's sad. And especially in my ward, we see a lot of empty homes. Uh, and to touch on the other part of public housing, I grew up in Section Eight housing. My my mom I was raised by a single mother. Uh, my sister and I were raised in Section Eight housing, uh, and a lot of families can't afford a lot of times to pay a full amount of rent. Uh, and making sure that we have programs like that. We have we have Shiloh uh, Home, Shiloh Commons now, which is able to Section 8 housing, which is in my ward, where it makes it more affordable for residents to stay in there. So making sure that we have more places affordable for residents who are on lower incomes and uh, fighting for that at the state level to make sure that all residents, not only in the city of Flint, but across the state who can't afford to really have a place to stay, have a place to lay their head at night. Ms. Candy. Wait, 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 this Okay, so for me, um, this, this question kind of goes toward the um, living wage argument, if you will. Um, when it says, how has this crisis affected my view on public housing? I think one of the things that we have to look at, because you, 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 I think we've gotten away from the fact that in the city of Flint, we like to work and we will go to work. And for whatever the reason, um, there's this thing of laziness that's tossed out and it's not true. What, what the reality of the situation is, a lot of times people have to have two and three different jobs um, as opposed to just one that pays a living wage where they can afford, you know, get some affordable housing. We've had mixed income housing come up where there's marketplace housing and uh, affordable housing all put together, but the bottom line is you still have people who are not making a living wage making two and three jobs. And so one of the things that has to be addressed is we need to bring more jobs into this industry. And I'm glad you're on the land bank so I can say this to your face.